big welcome for Angie, who's about to hop on. <laughs> hey, girl, what's up? Yeah. That's it, bring it on. That's the hat. I got the red hat. Can you read it? Can you I read it? Got it. I, I see it. Made you look. Woo! I gotta, gotta rock the hat. Can you read it? <laughs> From far away, it looks a little different, but you don't have to put the Kaepernick jersey on. Yeah, I'm ready. No, nope. yeah, you got the you got the merch going. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but let me let me show the hair. Let me show the hair. Hi, how are you? Bring it on, bring it on. I'm yeah. great, babe. I'm great. Had um, the premiere of American Utopia last night. Tell me how that. Uh, it went great. I mean, it actually premieres October 17th on HBO, but in New York, they're having a couple screenings at different drive-in theaters, like in Queens, the Bronx, and last night at Brook in Brooklyn. So uh, I'm pretty excited about it. We filmed it last February, uh, you know, with David and Spike directing. So, you know, I'm, I'm excited for it to be across, you know, or to be accessible for everybody. So, yeah. And to give context to people, too, um, I met Angie when, when we, we, uh, my band was supporting David's um, band. We got to have some good hangs in Australia and New Zealand. Um, <laughs> and I, yeah, I just loved how much you just soaked up the wherever we went. There were always so much stuff out and about, and it was always so fun to reflect with you, not only on music, of course, which is our common um, ground, but I also early on had a rapport where we were into discussing cultures and kind of yeah. issues early on. And I've really enjoyed our conversation, just our candid conversation about where we're at right now, not in our world, but in the music industry. Mm -hmm. I want to take that, take that conversation on because um, we've touched on so many great things at times that we've hung up. And as you know, down the rabbit hole, it's really about diving into those hard conversations that, we often veer in society because, you know, we like to get upbeat. Don't we? we don't want to get yeah. it right. And I think white folk are most kind of um, guilty of this because the world ultimately has been pretty designed. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do this work. But what my hope is with these conversations is that not only the black experience in the music industry, and the industry but that we can engage the white folk right, to, mm -hmm. feel, to feel safe, to feel well, to be humbled, to, mm -hmm. um, to go beyond being, work out what it means to be accomplished. Um, so that's a little ramble, but I really want to give you to Angie because you are a smart, smart woman. And I, I want to start by like, asking you about like how these problems are you because last time we spoke, you said that it had been kind of hard, you know, like in terms of yeah, like, yeah, yeah. or friends on these issues. And like at times, at times, kind of losing friends as a result of it. And, and do you, I mean, if it's not too traumatic to talk about, can you, can mm -hmm. you and what that's been like for you to engage your own friends around the time, especially those who are. Yeah, well, uh, first, it, it is cutting out a little. I'm, I'm, I'm getting your questions. I don't know. Am I coming through clearly? You're coming through great. Yeah, let me. Uh, okay. um, I'm getting the questions. I, yeah, I just got to. Um, okay, let me but move. But if, if, yep. if you can hear me, um, you know, it's funny. Actually, we met before David's tour. We, oh, you're right. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm forgetting. No, this is, and, and I'll be honest, I was starstruck by you. No, this was in Los Angeles. You used to have the jam sessions at the Bootleg Theater. And I sat in I sat in with you at Thundercat, and uh, Ron Bruner was on drums. Of course that, you that, did. Yeah, that was the Bootleg Theater in LA. So like many years, a couple years before I had even met David, we, we met like briefly, but I have a photo of us jamming on stage, so that that was pretty cool. But um, yeah, but I, you know, I'm really glad to be here today, and there's just so many important topics to touch on. And um, you know, I, I'm trying to remember your question, but yeah, it's been you know we're all going through something right now with this you know whole co you know we have COVID, and then you know the country is dealing with racial issues. It's just really a reckoning. Like all of this stuff has been happening, but I feel like with the quarantine and us just having t a lot more extra time than we usually ha usually do on a normal day or year, we are, um, 
you know, we're kind of forced to reflect on a lot of things and like yes. the mirror, you know, the mirror has been put in front of us. Yeah. And a lot of things we haven't been play paying attention to, whether we're being complacent or just not, you know, out of comfort. Like a, there's a lot of subjects we don't want to touch on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about how I was, you know, growing up in the U.S. and from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, like the education I was given told how the country was and what it was and what it became and what it's supposed to be now. Um, you know, they, they try to embed, embed that in us, almost like a brainwashing. Like every country does that, you know, whatever country you're from, you're the good guys, you're the heroes. You see it, yeah. in, mo you see it in movies, you see it in mainstream everything. So, but then like, as I got older, I, I kind of felt like I was going crazy because I'm like, this American dream that I've been told about my whole life, it doesn't feel that easy. It doesn't feel, the, the blueprint doesn't feel as easy. Like, I thought I was supposed to go to high school, go to college, get out of college, get a job. Like, it would just all naturally happen because that's the way it's supposed to be. But, you know, I turned 23. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not ready to have kids. I'm not ready to settle down. You know, I felt like my life was just beginning yeah. for the first time. But then to add on living the American dream or trying to pursue the American dream, while being a black woman or, you know, being a queer black woman. And then that's a whole extra thing. Like the world, the, 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 the blueprint that they put out, just like the constitution, it's written for mostly mm -hmm. cis white men. That's and really it's, hmm. it's something I, I didn't realize until I got older and I started seeing the differences, even like socioeconomics, like coming from Wisconsin, a middle-class person in Wisconsin is nothing economically speaking, like a middle-class person from Boston or the East coast where I went to college. And I start, so when I moved from Wisconsin to the East coast, I started noticing differences. I'm like, wow, they own three homes. You know, mm -hmm. this middle-class family owns two, three homes. It's really interesting. So I started seeing what the world was really like once I got out of the, the Midwest bubble. And, you know, so I feel like, you know, I learned in school, but I started getting my education in the real world. Yes. And that, that, that moved to the music industry, too. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so fascinating what you just said about the Constitution being written for cis white men and really that, you know, great blueprint if you mm -hmm. fit into that context, really. And so, yeah, yeah. No, you know, so it's, it's, it's when you put it like that, I guess you're right. You had to transform your entire worldview at the, around the age of 23, like you said, and mm -hmm. especially going into the music industry, which is the yeah. land of the American dream, right? Like, go and be a star. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Realize, oh, there's a few rules that come with that. There's a few, yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about well, that. Just but it's you... like, who, who, who made those rules, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, let's talk about that. Like, where, where do you see yourself now in the music industry? How do you think things have changed? compared to when you started out? Because your journey is super interesting in terms of the bands you've played with and your background. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I'll say what music industry? But um, no, that, that, that's a COVID joke. That's a COVID joke. But, um, <laughs> well, it, you know, things have definitely changed at warp speed. But I mean, I hate to date myself. Well, whatever. I'm 38 years old. When I went to Berkeley School of Music in Boston, I auditioned on a cassette tape. <laughs> when I was in Berkeley, I was doing projects on like mini disc or eight track, all that old shit. And then by the time I left, things be started to be started to become digital. So there started being free music like Napster and stuff. So, so the whole music industry started losing money. So it evolved that quickly. So by the time I left Berkeley, the industry had already experienced a huge change. Yes. Um, so, so I had to kind of adapt to that because the money that was flowing in once before wasn't, you weren't able to make a living like you were in the past. So, you know, adding that on there, it just really, it was kind of like a shock, like a shock to the system. And, you know, you had to be able to adapt to that. And I moved from Los Angeles, or I'm sorry, I moved from Boston to Los Angeles in 2005, which is the year around the year face the time Facebook came out. So again, technology was changing our industry so quickly that you really had to be able to adapt or you're going to just fall off the wagon so it was really kind of screwy and you know realizing the whole image thing like you know moving to LA I felt like people cared more about 
what you did than who you were, you know, the, the image, how you looked. And it was just like, a, again, the whole blueprint thing. And I was starting to realize this at, at a tw you know, 23 years old, you don't, you know, kind of bright eyed, bushy tailed. You're just like all the glitz and glamour of the industry. You're just like, oh, wow, this is great. But as you get older and start really observing, opening your eyes, you see these little loopholes and very, it's a very political system, whether it's like about gender or race, there's just very, you know, a lot of things in the industry that you, in other industries, you can't, you can't be hired or not hired because of how you look. But in our industry, they, that often happens. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're a guitarist, first and foremost, you're a musician on many fronts, but that's what you do with David Byrne. Mm -hmm. And we've talked a little bit about just how hard it is to find acceptance as a as a black woman who doesn't fit the mold necessarily um and how we open you know just open the way people view femininity view um the black experience the black musician i mean you've told me about times where people get the assumption that you know you're going to get up and sing and you know <laughs> you you just like it is sort of I, I want to better understand where some of those stereotypes come from and, and also just how you, how you've seen them play out in, in your life and how you have mm -hmm. like found ways to assert yourself. Because I think so much of when I talk to Dawn or other musicians, mm -hmm. they've, they've had to really work out ways to make yeah. their sense in this industry and put their foot down and like hopefully moving forward it won't have to be mm -hmm. as necessary to force that you know into the culture but mm -hmm. how have you found when there's not a space that's been made for you how have you found a way to assert yourself in the space and hold your space in oh. a place like american utopia and in, in a place like broadway you know what i mean mm -hmm. well First of all, I am a descendant of kings and queens. So, you know, I, I'm fruit from the land that born civilization. We, we are, um, you know, we, we came here as slaves and we were able to persevere to the point where people want to emulate our culture. And that, you know, music, mm. music and art is what kept, you know, it kept us sane. It helped us give our story. You know, we, the black people, we, we, we created blues from, from hymns and so, we built the foundation so it's a very strong you know Back group of people and and i feel like i kind of channel my ancestors with with really knowing who i am and knowing that we came from this and we're still going like no matter what i, I feel like the black woman is the strongest creature on the country or strongest creature on the planet yes and yes, and i really feel like somehow it's it's kind of like it's so deep. I, I, I like when I feel like I'm ready to give up, there's just always a spark in me that keeps going. And, you know, my mother raised me to be really strong and my grandmother, her mother, super strong. My, my father's mother was strong. So, you know, I just come from a lineage of Queens and women that never gave up no matter what. And they did the best they could with what they had. And yeah. so I kind of apply that to like everything in the industry. You know, I don't believe in the word. No, I always figure it out. Um, you know, like I, I, and, you know, coming, you know, the whole thing about walking into a situation and people make assumptions or generalize you. Like I walk into a club with a guitar. Oh, what do you do? Do you sing? I'm like, yeah. What makes you think that? What makes you think that? So yeah. it's just about really having strength within yourself to look past that and just realize people are fucking idiots sometimes. <laughs> so you, you yeah, really and have been conditioned. Yeah, mm -hmm. been yeah. conditioned. Yeah, people have been programmed, like it's subliminal. Like, yeah. for instance, I mentioned this to you, like it's the patriarchy, the hierarchy, where it's the, the white supremacy system. Like I'll walk down the street, sometimes a white guy walking, and it's almost like they expect you to move out the way for them. Yeah. And I would find, again, we've been conditioned. Like, I used to find myself being kind of submissive, like, oh, this, or like at a grocery store when somebody reaches for something, doesn't say excuse me, but you kind of feel like you have to move out the way for them. Yes. I have this new mentality. I'm like, why don't I hold my ground? If this person's taking up the whole sidewalk, they should be more aware of their space. It's not my job to move out for you. Everyone should be considerate of each other. And, you know, these are these barriers we need to break in this country because, I mean, you look at the Senate, you look at the government, 
it's kind of like a couple flies floating around in a bowl of milk. Like we gotta flush that milk out. <laughs> you know? I hear you. I hear but, you. you know, so much of that is visibility, right? Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think American Utopia. Like not to spend our whole time talking about that, but it is such a like fascinating. Um, and powerful kind of um, performance piece that everyone is now, you know, falling in love with across the world because it's going to be everywhere. Um, but, you know, talk to me about just like that experience of being in this space that is so, like you said, dominated, you know, originally by, by cis white men and kind of, you know, a lot of the people that come along to the shows certainly fall into that category. Mm -hmm. And David has been, you know, a very important person in, in, in trying to activate conversations around that. Not yeah. perfect, <laughs> not, like none of us are, you know, mm -hmm. and I, as I engage um, conversations around race, I make mistakes a lot as well. And I think that's, that's what I'm trying to overcome in these conversations is trying to lose the fear of making mm -hmm. mistakes. And I, I see you as someone who's been a really important friend to David through that. Um, and also, you know, I think he's set a precedent of what it looks like to really celebrate diversity on stage. And, and hopefully, you know, you'll see more of that taking place mm -hmm. with white artists in the music industry. But has that been, um, just talk to me a little bit about like how that has kind of come to be because you know you've been in the band playing in the band for a really long time now and i bet these conversations come up a lot because mm -hmm. it's such a diverse group of people and have they been productive and are they what do you see changing from from that dialogue well i i think it's an eye opener um you know um, american utopia i mean right now i see it as a fictional thing i want it to be yep. a reality what we see on stage is the dream. Yeah. Sometimes backstage, it's not, you don't, or like in any show, in the entertainment industry in general, it's super white. When the higher up you go, mm. in or not just in entertainment, in pretty much everything. And I, I feel even like back to the Constitution, it's super vanilla. And I feel like there needs to be more representation across the board. Yeah. But particularly with, with the show, I mean, it's such a beautiful thing. And I really... I'm happy to be a part of it. And there's just so much joy and love on the stage. And we want to give that to the audience. And, you know, the audience is predominantly white. And we hope we're being able to show people what what a utopia could be, what it could feel like, that the, the, equal, the equality, the happiness that, you know, whether through through race or gender and whatnot. Um, uh, yeah. And, you, yeah. know, you know, David bringing us on stage, but take it further. Yeah. You know, they're saying, you know, David's brought a diverse crowd on stage or a diverse group of people, musicians, influences. But think about where his influences come from. Afrobeat, mm. funk, yeah, rock. Exactly. You know, again, it comes back. Africa, the hearts. So it was nice. You know, I'm happy he's brought us on. But then you got to look like I any musicians or anything, any anybody I, I like or admire. And I admired him way before I was even part of this project. I like to look at what inspires them too. So yeah, yeah. Again, it's it's such a melting pot when you look at arts, like different different ethnicities and cultures influence other things. And so, you know, he embraces that. He acknowledges that, and that's that's really important too. Mm -hmm. And again, that's what I think the utopia is in general. Not not just with the show, but for us to, to share each other's talents and to embrace each other's differences versus using them against one another, like combining them. It's like, oh, I love gumbo. You know, like, I think of it like cooking. You put different ingredients together, you can come up with these wonderful dishes versus like something bland, you know, so. Yeah, no, that's so cool, man. It's so funny. I've seen American Utopia so many times, but I-, I I've never seen it. Have... I've seen it on screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> but I haven't, thought about it in, in that way that like what we are watching and partaking in is an idea of reality that we don't live in yet but that we we all sort of have a sense that we we want to exist in and that we know is possible mm -hmm. and I think that is a really important part of this um let's call it you know it, it, it this this movement this reckoning mm -hmm. is that we get to see examples of what it looks like to live in, in equality. No, oh, yeah, yeah. Life without hierarchy and life without mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think of the protests as a place like that at times, you know. The, pro the protests? Yeah, I think for a New Zealander sometimes, like, oh, yes, you know, yes. going along to and being mm -hmm. in a place like that where you just see so much 
that can be mm. it, that can be but but I would actually go further and say art probably is the yeah. place that does that best and I feel you know blessed mm. to be in an industry that's part of like displaying mm. the the dream for people you know of what we would want you know you know what's interesting about that in the protests you know you're seeing them in like LA New York and it's kind of for my, my opinion I mean I've attended a few but I'm weird with crowds um yeah. It, it almost feels like preaching to the choir because we're, we're protesting in blue states. Yeah. I've seen people move from New York back home to Texas, Oklahoma, or wh whatever, wherever, red states, and to, like, have that same energy in those places. Because right now, the country is so divided. I've had friends try to drive from New York to California, and there's so much going on in between. Again, I'm from the middle of the country. I'm from Wisconsin. And, yes. You know, we all have very different realities, and we have to somehow find a common ground with people that we don't think we have anything in common with. Um, we have to be able to uh, be humble enough to put ourselves in other people's shoes. And honestly, I went to a Trump rally by myself in August, 2016, oh, yep. before he was elected. Yep. Before these hats existed. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And cause I just wanted to see for myself, like I have friends that are Republicans. I have, I have, two uncles that are still Trump supporters, two black men, still Trump supporters. And I try my hardest to be able to see what they mean. I mean, it was really strange. I, I, I was super nervous walking, going into a Trump rally. Yeah. Um, I remember this woman sitting next to me, this like suburban Wisconsin woman, older white woman, like looking at me and I'm just being me. I'm just sitting there. Right. And she's like, are you a Republican? And I'm like, oh, I'm undecided. You know, this is before the election. And she's like, are you um, conservative? Or what do you do for a living? I'm like, oh, I'm a musician. I tour the world. And she's like, how are you able to maintain a conservative lifestyle with your job choice? And I'm like, you know, my wife asks me that every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not married. I don't have a wife. I'm just kidding. But I just wanted to see a reaction. But it was really interesting to hear a different perspective. I mean, because yes. it's almost like people's minds are wired differently. Like, I understood where they were coming from, though I did not agree. Mm -hmm. Because it was more like, what can help me versus what can help us? Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of, you know, we all have to make sacrifices, whether blue, red, whatever, you know, black, white, we, we have to really be humble enough again like i said to put ourselves in other people's shoes and look at these different perspectives with an open mind and it, it's hard because we're some stubborn motherfuckers <laughs> I'm, I'm stubborn but yeah you know, i try to take a step outside of myself whenever i can absolutely and i see that in you angie like i i watch you do that and i watch you listen to other people when we meet people on the road and i i can see that you're a person that that doesn't surprise me that you went to a trump oh. You know, they like, call, yeah, yeah. They call me the chameleon. They call me the seeker. chameleon. And you're a seeker. You're seeking, you know, at a different level. And I think that is actually a big theme of Down the Rabbit Hole that, that me and my friend really want to engage is like, what does it, because I'm, I'm having a few thoughts now when we talked about um, diversity on stage in American Utopia. There's, how do we get out of, as especially as a, a person of privilege in this country, a sort of tokenism, performative kind of activism that is like, oh, I've got my, you know, my, my black square, I've got my, 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 my black folk in the band who, who are there, I'm representing on that front. How, how do we move, you know, I've said the right things in the interview, I've done, I've ticked off the checklists. But so many of us know that sometimes that isn't actually doing the work at the deeper level. And, and as Dawn actually said, which is super powerful, it's like, and she said, I'm not sure if white folk know how to actually be second and let, um, you know, those who have had a different life experience, you know, be mm -hmm. furthest for a bit and give over the platform and not just, and, and that's a really tricky, un uncomfortable question for, you know, white folk to talk about because we have been living in a world that has been so designed for us to come first yeah. more and more i really do actually think there's something to that that it there is a step further that we haven't quite engaged yet and we've we're skimming the surface and look you know mm -hmm. let's take it it's still good you know that people are engaging but what do you think as someone who you know is engaged with so many people in the band and across the world what do you think holds holds people back from going the extra 
uh, it's comfort. I mean, people don't want to step out of their comfort zones. Like I've, I've had friends say, say like, oh, I want to help you. How my, my white friends, yes. when, the, when the pandemic first started, it was a lot because we're dealing still with racial injustice on top of the pandemic. And it was very stressful. And I actually got a lot of phone calls and emails from my white friends kind of, they wanted to make themselves feel better. So it was almost like they were asking me for reassurance. Like, I'm a good one, right? Like, I, I'm cool. I'm with you. Put a black square up. Uh, or, or, but nobody was like, are you okay? How can I help you? It was just like, it was like, oh, oh, I'm, oh, I've always felt this way and that way. And I kind of felt like everybody's therapist, but I already had my own bricks on my shoulders. Well, but I was trying to be available for everybody, but I was finding myself mentally exhausted, emotionally exhausted, and trying not to get sick from COVID, trying to figure out what the hell was going on with the world at that moment. Um, wow. So, so, yeah, it's it's been, you know, I, I just noticed a comment. Somebody said, oh, I, Angie seems more like a moderate. I'm not moderate. I'm just compassionate. Like, I just try to, like, yeah. like I said, put myself in other people's shoes, and whether what, I agree with them or not. I'm sorry, what? No, I jumped in on you. I'm sorry. But um, I just I got excited because what you're talking about is a humanity. It's like mm -hmm. the next step is not just a collective absolving of guilt of like, well, oh, well, I did the thing. And I, you know, it's like mm -hmm. we're talking about a humanity here, which is deep. Yeah, yeah. Put yourself in the other shoes and, and really take a deeper step to activism mm -hmm. with being human beings. Yeah. yeah, I mean, because that's all we are. We are humans being in the same place at the same time trying to make this shit work. And, you know, at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. We need food. We need love, compassion. And, uh, you know, just try not to push our beliefs so much on each other. You know, the whole it's the whole live and let live. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's try, That's what I try to live by personally. Um, you know, again, like I said, though, it's really hard when there's like one demographic seemingly making the rules for everybody and they've got these blinders on, um, you know, like, uh, you know, one person will feel really bad about one thing and then something that's equally as bad, they won't give a shit about. So I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's a really, you know, it's a deep conversation. I, you know, well, let's talk. I mean, when you say the demographic is, you know, and you're right about that, and you get higher and higher, we see the same people. Mm -hmm. right show. But what, you know, to get a little optimistic here, what mm -hmm. excites me is that when we talk about the music industry moving forward, we have to realize yes, it's run by these elites at the top, but mm -hmm. it's nothing without us. It is nothing without us. Well, yeah, it's it's the foundation. It's the foundation. Like, like if the foundation, this is what the government and the top 1% don't think about who's going to wipe your ass if you keep treating them like shit. I mean, like if the foundation falls through, everything crumbles. And that's what's happening right now. We have a pyramid. The middle class is disappearing. You got the higher, you got the people up top and then everybody else is on the bottom. So it's falling apart. And right now the people up top are laughing because the people at the bottom are busy blaming each other when we should be building each other up to keep that pyramid strong. Wow. And that's really the only way. Yeah. That... Can I just say your breath smells really good. Every time you go, wow, I smell like <laughs> fresh mints and fresh roses. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. What is that? Kimbra? <laughs> it is. Oh, yes. No, it's called Kimbra. <laughs> that's it. Um, no, I mean, look, you're, you're, t you're talking the truth here because the, we represent foundations of the music. Yeah. Industry. So the more that we create a culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of, and a value system that we yeah, yeah. on, you know, the record labels, the, 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 venue, the, the, the production teams, that all of these different assets of the industry, the mm -hmm. more we control the culture or not control, um, sort of define and, and, you know, display the culture that we want. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can start to, to see real change and, and, and some of the ideas mm -hmm out of these conversations it really got me excited about what could be possible when musicians oh, yeah. come together of all different you know the, across the board mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. want to see change in oh, the yeah. end and I, I do want to spend some time talking to you about what that would look like in all of your years you know going and you know I saw someone mention you know black woman and I think that's so true right so much it's probably easy at some point be like you know but like I'm out I'm but we can't we can't give up and mm -hmm. we don't have a choice to give up no no not at all you know i think um 
you know, the whole giving up, like, we're always going to deal with things not going our way or a setback or whatever. And like I had said to you before, I said, a setback is nothing more than a setup for a comeback. Like people are like, 2020 is canceled. I'm like, no, honey, 2020 means clear vision. You can see, I wish I had 2020 vision. I'm wearing contacts right now. But it's like, I this is that. our time to reevaluate and reassess ourselves. We can like start from scratch and build things, make it better. Include like the music industry, like it's, we've never dealt with this before, but we all have the tools. People can record hit albums at home now. We can collaborate. I can speak to somebody who's not in the same city as me virtually. We can work together excuse me, we can work together. And so I think this is like just, this is just the pivotal moment and it's just happened so much quicker than any of us could have ever fathomed. Yes. So I think this is really a, a very valuable and important and very prolific time for all of us that if we really sit and focus and unite and just stay strong, stay healthy and don't give up on each other, don't give up on people you don't agree with, yeah, you know, I, I really think we can build something great from this. But you know, the system as is, like, politically speaking, it needs to be fixed. I mean, we're still dealing with we're we're, we're living off a constitution that's hundreds of years old that doesn't make sense now. And it can get so overwhelming. I get mm -hmm. so, I get really overwhelmed during these conversations, before them, after them, because mm -hmm. it just big sometimes. And I think that's actually another reason why probably it's easy to throw up your hands a bit. And, you know, I've heard mm -hmm. friends of mine, especially my black friends, say, you know, we haven't had a choice to, to give up on this or walk out. Mm -hmm. or like, oh, yeah. Because that's your existence every day. But I think yeah. I find it overwhelming at times, mm -hmm. self included, and feel what, ugh, what could I even do to, to and, and that's where it's got to, you know, the conversation has to be halted because there is something to do as a person of privilege to engage mm -hmm. your, your friend to also demand um, demand new values um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. If you could, if you could put them out there in terms of ch real change, you wish upon the music industry moving forward, especially if we really do have an opportunity. Yeah. What kind of things? I know that's such a hard question. Eh? No, no, it's not a hard question. I already got. I had the answer two okay, minutes ago. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready, girl, girl. I got a roll of toilet paper here. I'm always ready for shit. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, um, what needs to change is up top. They really, like, you can do all this showboating stuff. Like I said, everybody's like, oh, yeah, let's show diversity. Let's hire a black woman. Let's hire, a, or a woman in general. Let's hire just to have that diversity, you know, let's to check off that diversity. No, honey, it doesn't work that way. It's got to start up top. Start hiring people in the executive level from different you know, from different uh, races, different sexual preferences, like make it diverse up top. So then when you have those meetings, like uh, this is a problem a lot of advertising companies have had, uh, like having blackface issues or just, they're again, blind spots. If you're a room of white, there's like a room full of white people making a deci decision about a black person, they might not see something that could be highly offensive to people. And so until you have the decision makers and this is a quick fix, too. It's just not going to take years and years of evolution. It's just like, let's do it. It's like freaking yeah. Nikes. Just just do it. You got to you gotta like sw switch it up up top, have a variety of people. You know, I'm tired of eating plain ass popcorn. Put some fucking turmeric on it or some truffle salt. <laughs> mix mix that shit up. Put some flavor in it because that's the only way it's going gonna, it's gonna to change is from here down. And... Yeah. They know that, but again, people are greedy. We are all greedy on different levels, and so people want to hold on to power however they can. Yeah, you're right about that. I think also, like, because I'm thinking, you know, my brain always goes, to, how do we implement, how could we, as, you know, artists that have influence, artists that have a sphere of, you know, um, networking, how would we make changes toward that? And it makes me think, you know, if people like us have to get up top. We can climb our way up there. I mean, right. yeah, no, that's kind of we're the next generation. There's a generation. I mean, I hate to date ourselves, make ourselves sound older, but there are at least <laughs> other generations of us, like people younger than us that are hungry. And we, first of all, we're very blessed as women in our thirties to have done what we did because now the world shut down. Imagine being 20, 21 years old 
and living in COVID, not being able to travel and explore things. Like we're very fortunate. We need to give those people in their twenties hope because after us, they come up and they, they need some kind of assurance that things are going to be okay. So we need to just keep speaking to them and having platforms and stuff like this to let them know that, you know, don't give up because you know, the, you know, the, the night's darkest before dawn. So mm. like, I think it's really important to just keep talking, just keep talking. Don't it's just the perseverance is important. And I've seen you again, I, I've seen you do that in your career. And I did. Your <laughs> yeah, no, you do. And I mean, you, you know this, that you're a very close friend of David, and you're, you know, you have that kind of friendship where you have trust where mm -hmm. you can call him out on things and he yeah. can come to you and he can ask you for your advice. And I really believe in that. I keep mm -hmm. people around me that I can talk to about issues of race, issues of sexuality, issues of yeah, yeah, yeah. that I can be like, Hey, look, I don't know if I'm saying the right thing here and I need a little, mm -hmm. I don't want to wear you out to have to explain this to me. Let mm -hmm. me do my own research too. But we have to feel safe enough to do that. That takes trust. And you've done that to mm -hmm. cultivate that with David. And it makes me think, you know, I had this opportunity now to sign to a new label soon. And mm -hmm. it looked like for me to ask the questions in the early meetings, you know, hey, tell me about the people at the top who's running this company. And, you know, yeah. My own music takes influence from a really diverse range of artists, and I want to see that reflected in the kind of people I sign with. Absolutely. You know, we can have influence. You can have influence by raising a question in the band about, oh, we've got such diversity on stage, but what about off stage? You know, and I know that's come up for you guys. Um, mm -hmm. Does it look like meetings with, with that? You know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know. Um, it's just a conversation. I mean, and, again, holding, yeah. pe holding people to accord. Um, and it's funny you mentioned David and I. I don't know if you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm. So, you know, Larry David would say something, all of a sudden Wanda Sykes shows up. <laughs> I'm kind of, it's kind of like that. It's yes, kind of like that. But, yes, But, yes. you know, I mean, he, he's very receptive and, and we grow together. We learn a lot from each other. And that, that's what, you know, I, I love working with artists like that. Not, you know, not just David, but other artists I've worked with in the past. Um, I'm sorry, I get news updates on my phone. I'm not going to read that because it might make my eye twitch. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I get, um, you know, t to be able to work with someone, again, that, that is humble, humble enough to, to, to even accept and to, to, to take in information and be like, oh, I never thought of it that way. And I'm the same way. I, if, if somebody has a different opinion, I'm not going to shoo them away. I want to hear what they have to say. Yeah. And we can find common ground in the middle. Um, but I think it's really important for checks and balances and friendships and any type of relationship you need to be able to have that trust and honesty and be able to, again, be the, the humbleness and like put you put down your freaking ego and just be like, what do you have to say? And I'll be, be receptive to it. And don't come up just defensive right away. Like, you know, I've, I've met, I've known people in my life and I've been this way too, where you're not, it's almost like you're hearing Charlie Brown's mother. You don't even want to hear something that has nothing to do with what you agree with. You just hear wah, 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 wah. You're not listening. You're just waiting to speak. Yeah. So, um, but again, like the relationship I have with him is wonderful because it is very, it's equal. It feels very equal. I just feel like I'm talking <laughs> to a very close friend. He's family to me. Wow. And that's, that's, that's the type of relationship for me now, as I've gotten older, I used to have a shit ton of friends and I still do have a lot of acquaintances in all the different cities I've lived in and places I've traveled. But for me, it's quality over quantity, yeah. especially with COVID. It's forcing you to keep your circles small and tight. And it's just like, you know, this is, th that's what life's about is like just being happy and, you know, not being stressed. You know, we don't have time. Like we, we are small. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been watching a bunch of Elon Musk videos and stuff recently. Just, I, I like what he has to say. And, you know, you go in outer space, we, we are very minuscule. There's like in our minds, every, the world is around us, you know, we're the center, but if you really look at the big picture, we are so tiny. That's and true. so, but we have to make the best of our tininess. <laughs> This might be too, like, you know, it's not personal, but like, you know, it might not feel right to talk about. But you did tell me about some friendships that didn't work out after oh, yeah. conversations. Can you talk to me about, you know, why they, they had to be, you had to go see your different ways after that? Well, I've had, you know, I try to maintain friendships as long as I can, you know, 
but you know, people grow apart over the years. I still love you, but our, our values have changed yeah. and we'll, we'll try to talk it through, but there are just some things that just don't mesh after a while. And I, uh, you know, for me, it's really important for my friends to understand how important racial issues are in this country. Yes. We're not, we're not making this up. We haven't been making this up. And there has been this stress on our shoulders. And finally, to be able to speak on it openly and not feel like people are trying to gaslight you and make it feel like it's in your head or everything's everything was resolved after Martin Luther King. No, they fucking shot him and he was peaceful. You know, they, they assassinated him. He was peaceful. So nothing has really changed. It's just, well, I mean, things have gotten better, but it's also evolved. I mean, mm. we still have so, so long to go. I mean, you, you had Jim Crow, slavery. Nothing has really changed. It's just been painted over with red, white, and blue stripes. And everything's great. Everything's great. But is it? And the whole, you know, everyone always says, make America great again. But then we go, when was it great? Right. You know, I mean, there's an elephant in the room. We wouldn't be dealing with this shit if there wasn't already that tension there. And now it's just kind of exploded. And again, we are having time. We're able to um, have time to reflect on this. You know, so COVID has been a blessing in disguise. Uh, you know, as 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 much as it's, it saddens me, we've lost so many people to us, over 208,000 people. And one is kind of recovering. <laughs> we'll talk about that but, yeah. but but it's just like um yeah we you know we we really have a long way to go and we need to really re reflect and and try to work together to make this right and go in the right direction and you know I, i'm honestly i'm fearful about november because whoever wins shit could hit the fan i know so that's why compassion understanding communication all that is so important right now with people you don't talk to with people you don't agree with if it's like somebody you haven't talked to in a while i you know i'm gonna call that friend again that i that we we, we kind of broke ways because she wasn't understanding for for me the the importance of she couldn't ex she couldn't talk about black lives matter to her family like she would say one thing to me but then be very vocal in a different way publicly and it was like who are you? Because you're being this way with me, but then you're being this way with someone. Who's your authentic self? And I, I couldn't recognize her. So I, I just said, I love you, but I can't have you in my life. That's really, no, I really appreciate like talking about that because I think that is, I want to understand the difference of what productive conversation is between friends of you know, different races and what is, mm -hmm. and what is really triggering for, mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. For someone you know like it might feel very well to have a conversation over the year and talk about the highlight what you're looking for is authentic mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know an, an authentic accomplishment all the way through you know yeah and yeah that probably leads me to the the question we, we talked about um, if you had one or two things or there's probably a lot of things that you really wish that white folk in particular, and the reason I focus here on white folk is because I really believe that now more than ever, this is our work to do. This is Yeah, you y'all started it. That's it. <laughs> and been a, for a long time. And you know, there's no on the sidelines anymore in this fight. And I, I say that for, you know, for you, for, for me, because I believe mm -hmm. that this is to benefit us all. You know, this is, we, we become both the oppressors and the victims. And, but if, if there was one thing that you, you wish ah, white folk are talking about this, but I really wish they'd talk about this issue together or talk about, you know, do, does anything come up there? No, uh, not really. I just think, I just think that the conversations need to ha be had more amongst each. Uh, like my, I hope my white friends are talking to my white friends. Like, okay. Again, I like, pe you know, people come to me like, Hey, we agree with you. We're with you. I'm like, okay. And they're, they're like, well, how can I help you? And I'm like, just t talk to your family. Yeah. Talk, to that cra talk to that crazy uncle that you don't talk to, you know, they are, are very uncomfortable conversations. And I understand that. But it's not going to change overnight. It's not going to change overnight. And that's just something we have to, you know, realize. Um, but I hope, you know, like I said, like, the, I, as musicians, we're very powerful. We, we I see so much joy in, in music. You know, people go, oh, stick to music. I'm seeing some of these comments. Oh, don't be a sociologist or whatever. I'm, I'm kind of scan, scanning through these comments a little bit while I'm talking to you. 
but you have to realize we are art imi into imitating life so yes sir. All, all you people tell us not to talk about politics um hello we're inspired by this shit so what's going on in the world right now um you know this it, listen to lyrics from the 60s 70s you know we're we're just ref we're reflecting what you're giving us you know and or we're, we're what we're yeah, we have a responsibility to reflect. Yeah, because absolutely. We have power in the platform to to mm -hmm. project viewpoints, and I think it's absolutely right that that you know the idea of stay in your lane is ridiculous mm -hmm. at a time like this. No one can they, on. no. stay in my lane, baby. I'm the fucking highway. <laughs> Like mine is, I feel like I want to say, get out of your lane, get out of the fucking lane. Yeah. Into, like this, the problem is when we all stay in our little nice little boxes. I stay over here as I talk about mm -hmm. things that feel comfy to talk about as a white girl from New Zealand. Well, then it's never going to get anywhere, are we? It's like get out of your lane and really get into. Um, yeah. You know, not to say, of course, I am not. You know, educated to talk on certain issues. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not mm -hmm. a. You know, but. I'm a human being. And so yes, like I said, humans being. You know, uh, who, who, who was that? Van Halen wrote that song what, from the Tornado soundtrack. I remember it. it's called Humans Being. But yeah, um, you know, we need this. We, we need to remain human. I mean, we're becoming robots more and more. I'm talking to you. I'm looking at a little hole in my... And I'm not even in a room with you right now. I'm, I'm looking at a little hole right here. Like we're, we're becoming more and more disconnected as we're quarantining and can't be six feet away, like we have to embrace each other however we can. And right now music is what could connect us, you know? So we need to, to be able to put this out more and, and you know, cause I can't even hug you, you know? So I gotta hug you with my music. I gotta hug you with my heart. I gotta hug you with my words and, and my, my thoughts and my, my creativity. Um, so it, music is important. Music is medicine. It is essential. And you feel that, like when I play on the street or see people playing on the streets in New York, you see how happy people are. It just brings people joy. So we are important. And to say we should stick to this or stick to that, we're sticking to life and we're keeping everyone alive. Imagine quarantine without movies, without music, without, you know, with the, without any of any arts, we would be, we would be insane. Yeah, you're so right about that. We, we live in this crazy birdhouse I made. Yeah, I made this. <laughs> It's my little bird. I, I you know. But anyways, uh, you please stay in lane, please. Just you're a musician, no bird. Stay in my lane. Whatever. Yeah. I'll, I'll show my little Russian dolls. Ah, привет, как дела? Way out of your lane, girl. I'll, I'll speak right. Ukrainian. Dobre dzień, jak sprawa? Dziękuję, dobre. Slava Ukraina. You really gotta. Hongong ya, daigaho. I'll start speaking Cantonese. No, you, you gotta embrace everybody. You gotta love everyone. Love you. I'm just <laughs> sorry. I'm being crazy right now. No. It's the tea. It's the tea. It's great, you know, be you, it's great. I'm just <laughs> thankful. I am, I'm really thankful for you. And I just look at you and I think, what an incredible, first of all, what an incredibly talented musician. You really, you know, you really inspire me to know that. We've worked you with inspire me. I, I listen, wait, wait, how, how, how much of my music do you listen to each day? None, because I haven't released any yet, but I will soon. But I listen to a version of me Oh. that's a, one of my favorite songs that is one of my favorite songs of yours and that line stay for the person i'll be we need to say that to each other because we're all going to evolve and stay for who we're going to be after this wow. so let's just like let's wait for each other because we're all going to grow and become better than what we are today and what we were yesterday so that's a really powerful song for me Oh. I, I hate using that word powerful because it's so overused. It's like the most overused. You you said it 14 times in this conversation. But uh, <laughs> no, I'm not that cool. I'm not that cool. But <laughs> but I could have played it off. But but uh, yeah, no, it's true. It's like we need to stay for each other. And, I think and you, to also clarify, like, I might not listen to your music every day in the sense of you know, tunes or whatever, but I have worked with you in the industry and I've witnessed your presence. In a no, I don't have any music to listen to. That's what I meant. Okay, okay so you're, you're in the clear. Oh, I know. There's nothing to listen well, to. I, I'm just saying that your presence and what I witness of you as a woman working in this space is is very powerful. No, it's very you know it it has a lot of presence and it and it 
it speaks volumes, I think. Mm -hmm. I've seen how it speaks volumes in the work, in the culture that you've created, in the mm -hmm. culture of, you know, and, and I say you because you guys have created that culture with David, you know, mm -hmm. and in all the bands that you're in. So thank you for being such a boss, honestly, and turning up and, and challenging people and, and challenging people to know your worth and to know the worth of this fight. That this is, you know, I think what I'm taking away from this as well is just like, this is not going to be an easy fix. We're not going to click up and come up with the other. going to be a lot of this. And I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. people are sticking around for these conversations because they are abstract at times. But I think the more mm -hmm. we can turn up as humans, not as, you know, red, white, or New Zealander, or, you know, Wisconsin, LA, mm -hmm. but actually to see each other, two people really wanting to better ourselves um, and mm -hmm. move but then I, I do think change can happen, Angie, and I'm I'm excited for some yeah, things. Yeah. I, I really think top down is possible if we decide that we that's the industry that we demand. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it comes again for equality, or you know, like even like in the music industry, like being paid as a female uh you know we get gotten paid less or as a as a black person paid less sometimes like i don't want to be paid equally i want to be paid fairly based on what your resume is and you know that's yeah. a whole nother issue yeah um, yeah so it's it's just we really have to like everything has to crumble and be built back up like i think about when i was a kid playing with building blocks and or legos or or clay like molding clay like i you know how they say the constitution, the American constitution is a living, breathing thing. There's still stuff in there like hundreds of years ago. that just doesn't make sense to us now. But if you think of, uh, if you think of like, like a piece of clay, it's, it can constantly be molded. And mm -hmm. again, finding the common ground, we can build new sculptures and new structures mm -hmm. that can work for everybody. Because again, coming back from American utopia, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And imagine if we uplift each other versus tearing each other down and apart, you know, we're always going to be miserable. Like, you know, I see people getting sick of COVID and they're like, oh, oh, I don't want to deal with this anymore. But just because you don't want to deal with it doesn't mean the elephant has left the room. It's still stuff we need to take care of. And once we do, things are going to, you know, calm down for us. And then we can all lift, you know, be excuse me, we can be more comfortable because, yeah. you know, it's not going to just disappear because you want it to. But once we start working at it, and, and I understand, you know, when 9-11 happened, it was very tangible. You could see, it was very isolated too. It was in that one area. That happened. Everyone yep. saw, saw it with their own eyes. You remember where you were. And then with COVID, it's an invisible enemy. Yeah, yeah, it's and, yeah. and you're dealing, you know, and you're you're dealing with xenophobia, where oh, these people, there's a lot of finger points. It came from here, it came from there, but nobody sees it. It's just, it's an invisible enemy. It's not tangible, um, so people have disbelief, and it's like, mm -hmm. I don't believe it till I see it. I, I know people that it's affected their family members, and they still don't believe it. It ha it's, it exists, yeah. but if we think of it this way, whether it exists or not, how do we how can we fix this? Like, you know, if you feel a cold coming on, you're going to take vitamins. You're going to do what you can to stay right. healthy. If your throat's dry, you're going to drink water to quench your thirst. All right. So like there's something eerie in the air. Let's do what we can to make it better versus denying it because denying it is just going to prolong the pain. That's great, Angie. That's, that, that's actually super, um, you know, like, talking about vision 2020. I'm just thinking of what you said there, 2020 clear vision. Let's make visible the things that are invisible. And I think of like so much of these racial microaggressions and things that float around. Oh, yeah. it's, oh, it's, yeah. It is like an invisible thing, isn't it? That we, we are now attempting and after a very you know long time coming, trying with all of us engaged in the conversation to make this really visible because how can we address something that we can't that we still can't see so that's super super well cool. think of it like a fart you can't see it but <laughs> something stinks man watch out for my swan finger puppet no it's true it's like something's off you feel the eeriness i mean stevie wonder said this recently how there's dissonance in the air you're not even a musician but you hear the harmony 
the harmony is off, like something's not right. How mm -hmm. can we make it right again? Yeah, beautiful. And I think, I think we all have the same answer. We just all have different approaches. Mm -hmm. so we got to figure that out how to help us, it. You know, that mm -hmm. can help us have compassion, can't it, when we look yeah. at it? Yeah. Absolutely. Anyone who's tuning in right now, please make sure that you do watch American Utopia when it comes out. Give us the date one more time, Angie. Uh, it comes out on Saturday, October 17th on HBO Max. Okay. And also, I'm hoping to, <laughs> we'll see if this happens. I got to get it mixed and mastered. Uh, if yes. I, I, I will be releasing my first single ever. That uh, is so it exciting. It's going to be either shortly before, mostly shortly after American Utopia comes out. Um, it, you know, I, I've played with so many different artists, Adam Lambert, CeeLo Green, uh, yeah. uh, Nicole Scherzinger, Fifth Harmony, yep. and, and so many more. And it's like, it's, it's easy to play for people. Or Macy Gray, it's easy to play for people. But then like, to have something I've created that came from here and came from here, it's just like, that's a very vulnerable thing. I, I, I commend artists mm -hmm. that are able to do that. So I'm really excited to finally be able to share my, my voice and my thoughts and my quirky music with the world. Yeah, so. I'm pumped to hear that for real. I really, I know your brain. I know your brain and I'm excited to hear what, what will come from it in that capacity. Oh. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, Angie, thank you so much. Um, oh, is it over? It's only been like 10 minutes. Uh, Dude, they're going to kick us off. Been... I know, it sucks. Oh, I, they I, do I, do that. I, I know. I could keep going with you. I feel like we only just kind of got started as well. Like, in terms Yeah, of... I'm going to have to read these comments later and yell at some people. <laughs> <laughs> but with compassion, I'll yell at you in cursive. <laughs> Stay for the person they'll be. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Sweet relief, sweet relief. <laughs> true fan i like it i am um, a true fan i told you i'm starstruck girl i'm starstruck by you but i'm i, I just learned how to play it cool well you're i drink you're decaf tea you're totally I drink decaf cool. tea. well yeah, that's like yeah i mean look yeah <laughs> it's, no no seriously like, like like no decaf tea or decaf coffee you know it's, it's like a it's like a vibrator of no battery it'll fill you up with no buzz okay <laughs> Am I not supposed okay. to say that? <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's all this. Hey, no Wanda Sykes. Wanda, I'm like the love child of Wanda Sykes and Prince. Let's go. <laughs> Dude, you make me laugh so hard. Um, That's good. La laughter's good. It we got a love. It releases endorphins. Yeah. We got a love. Yep. Oh, no. I love you, Thank Angie. You. I love you, too. Thank you for having me. Yeah, really, really great. And we'll, we'll talk more soon. And thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Um, you're part of, you know, you're part of the change. You're part of the conversation if you turned up there and stuck it out. So thank you. Um, we'll be back next Monday down the rabbit hole. Um, thank you to Angie again. And we'll be um, uploading some, some resources from you um, at the Demon Dap Instagram this Friday. So if people want to follow up with any of the stuff that we talked about, you can log mm -hmm. on to that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, see ya, hon. Bye.